Most computers store their data on a hard disk. We can see how a hard disk works by looking at this disk here, which has a transparent case. Inside is the disk, and as I switch it on, you'll see the disk begin to spin up. When that's up to speed, it's going around 10,000 times a minute. You'll also see there's a little arm here in a moment that will start flitting backwards and forwards across the surface of the disk. And it's that movement that you can often hear making the clicking sound from your computer. Now, see how that works. We have a giant model here. This is the disk, and on the surface of the disk, we have lots of little magnets, and these represent the binary digits. So here we can see some alternate blue and red dots. The red dots are magnets with the north pole up, those represent the ones, and the blue dots are magnets with the south pole up, and those represent the noughts. Now, this is that head that we've just seen, and at the end of the head is a little sensor which detects the magnetic fields, and that's sending its signals to this computer, and you can see indeed that those little magnets in that inner curved track there are alternate ones and noughts. Now I've got a real magnetic disk here mounted underneath this microscope. And on top of the microscope, we've got a camera. And if we can take a feed from that camera, please, and just bring it up on the screen. Here you can see these curved tracks. And if we just uh, zoom in on that, this, here, this is a speck of dust. It gives you some idea of the scale of this. These are the curved tracks, and you can see they have these stripes. Each of these stripes is a little magnet. It stores one binary digit. So we've seen how to represent numbers as binary, and we've seen how binary numbers are stored on a hard disk. But what about other kinds of information? For instance, have you ever wondered how we store music on a portable music player? Well, to find out, please welcome the person who composed the music for this year's lectures, Max de Wardener. Well, while Max was playing there, I was recording the sound on this computer, and I'll just play it back and we'll listen to that again. OK, now this yellow curve that you can see here represents that sound. It's the pressure waves in the air. And these pressure waves are being sampled 44,000 times a second. If I just slide this cursor along, we can look at some of these samples. Here's one. It has a value of uh, 31,000. And that's been converted into this binary number with 16 bits. If I go along a little bit further, it has some different value, that's 34,000. Again, that's been turned into a 16-bit number. So 44,000 samples a second, each of which is 16 bits. But what about other forms of information? For example, images or video or text or even computer programs? Well, everything that's stored in your computer is stored as binary. Max, thank you for joining us. Now, the problem with storing music directly in this way is that it would take up a huge amount of space. Just 10 seconds of music would need 14 million bits of data. If we want to fit thousands of songs onto a portable music player, we're going to need to find a way to compress the data. That means we have to represent the same music in fewer bits. Well, how can we do this? OK, for this I'm going to need a volunteer, please. Who would like to come on out? Yes, why don't you come out? Can you stand here? OK, and uh, what's your name? My name's Nikki. Nikki. All right, Nikki, I want you to take this pen, and in a moment I'm going to ask you to think of a number, any number you like, between 0 and 31, OK, and then write it in nice big writing on this board, and then just hold it up, right way up, so that the camera can see it, OK? I'm going to be blindfolded, so I won't know what the number is, and I'm going to try and work it out, OK? So someone's going to put a blindfold on me now. And uh, once I'm blindfolded, I just want you to think of a number, any number you like, between 0 and 31, and just write it in nice big writing on that sheet for me, and then hold it up to the camera, 
so that everybody can see except for me. Okay, have you done that? Yeah. Okay, and I want you to remember that number. I want everybody to remember that number. And then I want you to turn the board over so that I can't see it. And let me know when you're ready. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, you want to take the blindfold off then? Okay, so everybody knows the number written on that board except for me. I'm going to try to work out what your number is, okay, and I'm going to ask you questions. When I ask you a question, all I want you to do is answer yes or no, okay, and people can help you if, if you get stuck. Okay, right, my first question is, the number you've chosen, is it 16 or more? It's more than 16. More, it's 16 or more. Okay, so the answer is yes. So I'm going to put up a one here just to remind me that you answered yes. So I know the number is 16 or more. So my next question, is the number 24 or more, yes or no? No. No, it's not 24 or more. Okay, right. So let's think. My next question is, is your number 20 or more? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is your number 22 or more? 20? Yes. Yes, yes, happy with that? Okay. Is your number 23? No. No. So your number must be 22, is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Do you want to turn it over and we'll, we'll see? Oh, it's up on the screen. Okay, so 22. So I managed to work out your number with just five questions. And in fact, no matter what number you're chosen between 0 and 31, I can always work it out in just five questions. And the reason for that is because all I was doing was working out the binary form of your number like that. All right, thank you very much. You can sit down. Thank you. So my first question there was really, is that number in the top half? Is it between 16 and 31? Is it in the top half of the range, yes or no? And once I knew that it was, I then took that half and halved it again. I said, was it in the top half of that range? So this technique of taking a problem and then cutting it in half and then cutting it in half again is very efficient. It's called divide and conquer and it's a trick that computer scientists use all the time. Now I could have solved that problem in a different way. I could have asked 32 questions of the form is it zero, is it one, is it two and so on. And the answer would then have had 32 bits. But I was, I was able to, to represent the same number, the same answer, using just five bits. So when we take information using a lot of bits and we reduce it down to fewer bits, that's called data compression. Now, music is often compressed with something called MP3. And MP3 goes even further because it throws away aspects of the music which the human ear finds very hard to detect. Now, taking music and compressing it using MP3 is another example of a computational recipe or algorithm. And there are lots of other problems that are much more complicated, but which computers are also very good at. So for example, classical physics is very well understood, and it's described by equations that were worked out over 300 years ago by Isaac Newton. Now I'm gonna prove just how predictable and reliable these equations are by conducting an experiment in which even a tiny variation in the laws of physics could result in my getting killed. I have here a solid steel ball. It weighs 14 kilograms. It's incredibly heavy. And it's suspended from the roof of the Faraday Lecture Theatre by this steel cable. Now what I'm going to do is to take this steel ball over here and I'm going to stand with my back against this headrest. And in a moment I'm going to place it against my face and then I'm going to let go. <laughs> it's going to swing out across the lecture theatre and then it's going to swing back towards my face. Now, according to the laws of physics, it should stop just before it touches me. OK, that's the theory. Let's see what happens. I think this is probably worth a countdown, isn't it? OK, are you ready? Three, two, one, go. I'm very pleased that the laws of physics are nice and robust inside the Royal Institution. 
Whatever you do, of course, please don't try that experiment at home. <laughs> so the laws of classical physics are very well defined, and computers can simulate these laws very accurately. For example, it's used in flight simulators. Flight simulators today are so accurate that an airline pilot that's, who's training on a new type of aircraft can actually do all of their training on the flight simulator. The first time they ever fly a real aircraft of that type is with fair-paying passengers. Of course, software is also used to tackle much harder problems. And to give us his thoughts on the power of software, joining us live by satellite from the USA, please welcome Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill, welcome to the Christmas Lectures, and thank you very much for joining us. It's great to be here. Bill, we have a question from uh, Thomas, who's sitting in the audience here. Thomas, do you want to ask Bill your question? What do you think computing will be like in 50 years when I'm your age? <laughs> <laughs> well, 50 years is a, a very long time. Uh, if we look 50 years ago, computers were so expensive that people thought of them as just for governments or big companies. And in fact, they scared people. Now we've got it so they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, individual people can own them. They're viewed as empowering. They let you reach out and learn things about the world. A big change will be that we'll be able to write software that models the world. So for example, understanding if you're designing a product, you know, try now, is this car going to be uh, cheap? If it's in a crash, will it respond well? If I'm thinking of a medicine, uh, it, does it have the right shape? Will it have the right effect on people's bodies? So being able to model the world will allow us to be way more productive. Also, in the time frame you're talking about, we'll even have robots, uh, computer-controlled machines that can uh, do hard tasks, uh, today, some robots uh, clean up the carpet, but that's very simple. These robots will be able to see and walk just like human beings, and so uh, it'll, it'll be a radical change, uh, and that'll probably happen even in 25 years. Uh, for the next 25 years after that, you know, I think we'll all be surprised because computing could go a long, long ways from where it is today. Bill, we have uh, Olivia up here, and Olivia has a question for you. Olivia, do you want to ask your question? Um, do you think computers will ever be able to think for themselves? That's an excellent question. And even within the field, you find people who disagree. Uh, as we learn about human intelligence, our admiration for how powerful the brain is just goes up and up. The way that an infant can acquire vocabulary and common sense and a sense of time and just pick up a book and learn new subjects, you know, we still have nothing that's even close to that. In some areas, like vision or listening or even locomotion moving around, the last five years there has been very good progress. And so I think we can say for sure that we'll match human ability in terms of senses, uh, seeing, smelling, tasting, being able to move. But when it comes to learning and the broad general purpose way that humans learn, uh, certainly nothing dramatic will change on that in the next decade. Beyond that, it's really a little bit guesswork. Uh, people like myself think, yes, computers will eventually be smart. It's a little bit scary, uh, but getting the computer to be a little bit smarter and to be an even better tool, I think, can be a, a very positive thing. Bill, perhaps you could finish with one Last question, which is to do with an area that's very close to my own research interest, which is uh, the use of software in medicine and healthcare. What do you think the exciting opportunities are there? The most interesting area today, if I was a young person, is on that boundary between the very best computer science and medical advances. You know, I think about it a lot, not just in terms of the rich countries, but also the poor countries, where you still have a lot of terrible diseases like malaria and AIDS and you know, I know this is the golden age of using digital software uh, to help improve the practice of medicine. Bill, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.
We've seen that there are plenty of important problems for computers to tackle. But after the break, we'll be looking at problems which are so hard that even a supercomputer can be completely overwhelmed.